This is a special standalone episode of the Holistic Matters podcast series, today with our guest, Dr. Lars Bode, professor of pediatrics at the University of California, San Diego, and the director of the LRF Mother Milk Infant Center of Research Excellence. Our topic today is human milk oligosaccharides, namely 2-FL, or 2-fucosalactose, the most abundant human milk oligosaccharide found in breast milk, making up 30% of all breast milk HMOs. Co-hosting today's special episode is nutritionist Sarah Labremblaska and nutrition scientist Weston Bussler. I'm very excited to be here today with Dr. Lars Bode, uh, who is one of the leading experts in human milk ogular saccharides. So welcome, Lars. Excited to be talking to you today. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, excited to talk about human milk oligosaccharides. Let's dive in because many of our um, listeners may not even know what is a human milk ogular saccharide. Could you explain what that is? Right. So maybe just to dissect the three words, uh, human milk is clear, right? So it's something that has to do with uh, breast milk. Uh, and oligosaccharides, oligo means a few and saccharide means sugar. So it's really a few sugars uh, that we have in human milk that are really particular to human milk. We don't have them in any other uh, milk supplements and we don't find them anywhere else. So they're not growing on trees. Uh, it's very difficult to make them. So um, it's very particular components that we find in human milk. And they are complex carbohydrates, uh, really. So what led you to start studying and really focusing your life's work around human milk ogular saccharides? Yeah, that, that's a great question. How on earth do we get into studying components in human breast milk, right? It really all started back in high school uh, when I was a, uh, an athlete on the site and, you know, tried to improve my performance and uh, decided to study nutrition and eventually got my PhD in nutrition as well, nutrition sciences. And uh, I had to do an internship during the summer breaks. And one of the internships was at a formula company. And they studied, among other things, the human milk oligosaccharides. And I just found it absolutely fascinating what these oligosaccharides are, what they do, how little we really know about them when it comes to how they are synthesized in the mammary gland, and then what they do to improve infant health. So for me, that really was the most fascinating things to, to study. And that's what I stuck with. So really started the research program around that in 2009 here at UC San Diego and grew that into, into what it is today. Earlier, you were breaking down human milk ogular saccharides and focusing on, on ogular saccharides. I mean, we see other ogular saccharides um, that do come from plants, right? Like FOS or GOS. So what really makes the human milk ogular saccharides so uniquely different than those FOS or GOS or some of the other ones that are out there? Mm-hmm. So it's really the composition of these uh, oligosaccharides. You see galacto-oligosaccharides, fructo-oligosaccharides, gosphorus. The composition, they're also, they're also carbohydrates, but the composition is different. So they build out of different building blocks. So all oligosaccharides are built of what we call monosaccharides. So that's the building block sugars. And for the milk oligosaccharides, they are made out of five different building blocks, so glucose, galactose. And it's two glucose, I mean, fucose and silic acid, whereas GOS and FOS are made of different building blocks, and we don't find them in human milk. So we know that the structure of these oligosaccharides really determine their function, and that's really what matters here, that uh, just because something is called an oligosaccharide doesn't mean that they all do the same thing. Their specific structure determines what they do. That's interesting, because as we see previously, like in infant formula, Goss and FOSS were used, but now we see a transition. And is it really just because of the availability now? Yeah, I think that was one of the major obstacles to have real human milk oligosaccharides available at a large scale and low cost to be able to really apply them in infant formula and now in, 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 in other products as well. Uh, I can give you an example. When I started working on human milk oligosaccharides at the end of my PhD thesis, we did some calculations how much it would cost to add one oligosaccharide that we had studied back then um, to infant formula, and the package would have been $1.5 million. Uh, and of course, that's not possible at all. But uh, now, 15 years later, just imagine 15 years later, the advances in, in making these oligosaccharides and what we know about them, you find them now in multiple different products. And the price has not gone up that dramatically, certainly not to where we were. The package would cost $1.5 million. Mm -hmm. 
so that leads us into this idea of like, well, now we see them being manufactured. Are the ones that are being manufactured, the HMOs, identical or are they different than what we see in human breast milk? Mm -hmm. So, so um, what's identical is the chemical structure of the individual oligosaccharides. So maybe to go back one, one step, in human milk, we have about 150, 200 different structures that we all call human milk oligosaccharides. We're able to synthesize a handful of those maybe at large scale and low cost. And those are chemically identical to what we have in human milk. However, in human milk, we have many other oligosaccharides as well that we can't make synthetically uh, available at this point. And we think that the mixture of oligosaccharides has some advantage over just individual oligosaccharides, of course. So in many of the infant formulas and other places, adult formulas and so on, we're seeing 2FL specifically available. Can you talk what is unique about 2FL in the overall aspect of the HMOs? So 2-FL stands for 2 fucosyl lactose. So again, you can take that apart. It's a lactose that carries a fucose residue. So you, you talk about the building blocks, right? The five different building blocks. So here we have fucose added specifically in a specific linkage to lactose. And that's what we call 2 fucosyl lactose or 2 prime fl And uh, it's one of the most abundant oligosaccharides in human milk, in many of the uh, human milk uh, samples that we have analyzed. And uh, we think it has some effects on, on uh, preventing infection, feeding a, mi a healthy microbiome, doing all kinds of things. Uh, but again, it's one out of many oligosaccharides, but this is the one that has become available um, um, the earliest, and there will be others to follow probably. Yes. I think it's really interesting how things have progressed with um, the production specifically of 2FL, Last five, six years, right? And now we're seeing additional ones that will probably move forward. You know, traditionally, when we think breastfeeding is best, and we believe that, that how long was a child receiving breast milk, thus getting the human milk algular saccharides, and up until what age? Do we think historically or through evolution? Yeah, for evolution, I mean, that all is based on speculation and you know some comparative uh, studies, of course. Um, but right now, what the WHO and others recommend is exclusive breastfeeding up to six months and then continuing um, breastfeeding um, up to two years. Uh, there is uh, thoughts that that breastfeeding, at least in in the in the old ages, uh, was much much longer than those two years. That that infants and children would receive even up to five years or longer. Uh, so there would be a continuous exposure to these milk components, not exclusively, of course, there would be other food components that come in, but access to oligosaccharides through human milk was probably much longer than what we see right now. Weston, you were going to ask some questions in regards mechanism of action, and do you want to dive in and maybe start that conversation a little bit more so we can really think about how the mechanism of action is happening in regards to 2FL and other human milk algular saccharides? Yeah, sure. Lars, this um, overall, I, I just, I get so excited when I start looking into all the possible interactions that can happen once we wind up consuming something because just the trillions of microbes that could possibly interact with any of these particular, uh, any of these particular milk oligosaccharides. But what, what would be the specific first things that you would expect to see when one of these uh, just, just as it passes uh, or as it's initially ingested, something like a human milk oligosaccharide, what's going to happen to it and what areas does it interact in the, in the body? Yeah, maybe, maybe let's start uh, with the exclusion criteria first. What does not happen to the oligosaccharides? And I think that is important to highlight as well. So they do not get digested by the infant's um, enzymes and low pH in the stomach and those kinds of things. So it's not the typical, when we think of sugars, you know, they get degraded by infant enzymes and then they get uh, metabolized and you know, used as, as energy sources. That's really not what happens for human milk oligosaccharides. So they resist low pH in the stomach and then pancreatic and freshwater enzymes make it into the large intestine. And that's where most of the action really happens. And that's where they start interacting with different microbes uh, either by getting degraded so they serve as food for these microbes or by doing many, many other things directly or indirectly related to the microbiome. What kind of microbes then, uh, what does it take for them to be able to uh, use these as food? So there's multiple different ways that microbes can interact with 
human milk oligosaccharides or oligosaccharides in general, either they have degradating enzymes on the surface of bacteria that then can cleave some of those um, building block linkages and eventually take in some of the fragments and heat for energy utilization uh, and then have an advantage to grow and spit out um, uh, postbiotics, as we call it, that then have an effect on the host. Uh, it's also possible that some bacteria take in entire oligosaccharides um, and then start chopping them in little pieces inside the bacteria, um, maybe releasing small fragments to the outside so that other bacteria can live off of it. So it really starts to become a community feast where it's not just one specific strain that takes on the entire oligosaccharide and utilizes it, uh, it to, to their advantage, but really where you have a community of microbes that together utilize oligosaccharides to the best of their abilities and then start to grow and suppress potentially other microbes that we don't want to have in the gut. So you mentioned something earlier about the infections and, and infections mm -hmm. being related to this. Can you go into a little bit more detail on how these would potentially be involved in something like that and the immune system in general? Mm -hmm. So a uh, big topic, let's break that down into, into a few different routes here. So when I say that oligosaccharides uh, promote the growth of certain beneficial bacteria, that then would mean that other bacteria cannot grow, right? So you kind of suppress potential infectious pathogens by allowing other bacteria to grow. So it's a question of uh, preference. Uh, and then there's other mechanisms as well where you have oligosaccharides specifically targeting certain infectious pathogens and suppressing their growth. Or we know that uh, many pathogens or bacteria in general need to attach to um, epithelial surfaces in the gut. And these oligosaccharides then serve as soluble decoy receptors that prevent the attachment of, of, of certain pathogens. And that way these uh, pathogens cannot attach and not cause disease. So there's multiple different ways of how oligosaccharides can suppress pathogens and, and protect us from infections. Is there any... Uh potential effect on uh, viral, uh, or is it just going to be more bacterial specific? No, we've actually seen this for um, viruses, bacteria, and for protozoan parasites for multiple different uh, pathogen uh, lineages, really. Um, there is data on rotavirus infections, for example, which in the infant space is still one of the major uh, cause of uh, diarrheal disease, um, viral cause in infants. Uh, but we've also seen this for Entomobius lytica, uh, for protozoan parasites in general. So it's it's not just bacteria, it's others as well. And do the specific uh, milk oligosaccharides, the human milk ones, do they have particular species of microbes that they're better at interfering with? Yeah, it's always a very structure-specific interaction. So depending on the pathogen and how the pathogen interacts with the host to drive disease, uh, you somehow need to block those interactions, and that is very structure-specific. So for some pathogens, uh, a 2FL works. For other pathogens, other oligosaccharides work. So it's really um, highly structure-specific. Yeah. So I think I've seen something before uh, about the milk oligosaccharides interfering with yeast binding. Is that something that you've uh, you've come across? Yeah, we have one paper uh, that we published a few years ago. Um, where we see that oligosaccharides directly interfere with yeast uh, yeast um, um, morphology, but also then attachment to epithelial cells. So, so there's some work done in that space as well. Okay, and then um, what about the things that these these more negative microbes would produce? Is it just is it just the microbes themselves they interfere with, or do they have interactions on the the outside with? any of those uh, potential uh, bacterial components that they produce. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so some bacteria pathogens um, produce toxins, for example, uh, Shiga toxin is an example, um, others. And, and there we also know that some oligosaccharides block the um, receptor binding of the toxin to the receptor on the, on the host, not just uh, bacteria interfere with the bacteria itself, but also with bacterial products that potentially then cause disease. Then I guess when we look at these, um, now that they're widely available for use in infants, one of the areas that's been really, really of major interest uh, for health is any potential for adult uses. Does this interact with adult microbes that would inhabit the adult GI? Uh, possible. Um, so we do see that um, 
oligosaccharides are not only metabolized by uh, by infant specific microbes um, and certainly there is a potential to develop symbiotics so we have a probiotic and milk oligosaccharide as a prebiotic uh, and then really drive a knowledge based evidence based development of these symbiotics where you specifically give a probiotic to an adult and then feed a human milk oligosaccharide with it when you know that the probiotic can actually metabolize it. So you give it an extra boost by providing uh, the preferential food with it. Uh, certainly possible. And, and I think it's a very interesting, uh, exciting space to move what we learn in the maternal infant field into adults and, and see how we can uh, utilize that for different other diseases in the adult space as well. As we think both in the adult and the infant space often is this gut barrier function and tight junctions, and some like to refer to it like a leaky gut. So do you see HMOs playing a role in helping that, that barrier function in the gut? Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's some initial data that shows that uh, human milk oligosaccharides have an impact, in, impact on gut barrier function in multiple different ways. Again, either indirectly by shaping global communities and then whatever those microbes produce has a positive impact on gut barrier, but also there might be direct effects where the oligosaccharides directly um, target the epithelial cells, interact with epithelial cell receptors, and then either strengthen tight junctions or uh, strengthen uh, mucin uh, synthesis uh, and other barrier uh, components. So absolutely possible that, uh, that human milk oligosaccharides have direct and indirect effects on gut barrier. Lars, I've seen some of your work that's dealt into the these mucin glyc glycans specifically, or the, the mucin that the body produces. Is there any similarity between these mucus compounds and the milk oligosaccharides? Uh, or how, how do the, does that interaction play? Yeah, very much so. So mucins are um, O-glycans and uh, glycoproteins that sit on the epithelial surface or are secreted from the epithelial cells and build this thick layer that separates the lumen in the intestine from the actual cells. So there's this thick layer of mucins in between. And it turns out it's almost the same enzymes that make these mucin gly uh, glycans also make human milk oligosaccharides. So the structures are remarkably similar. That's why it's possible that oligosaccharides from human milk can serve as uh, soluble decoy receptors when pathogens try to attach to those mucin uh, uh, components in the intestine. Uh, and, and then there's many other similarities as well. So yeah, there, there's um, uh, a lot of the same thing between human milk oligosaccharides and mucin carbohydrates. So there's both receptors on the surfaces of epithelial GI cells and potential binding locations in the mucus lining them. Yeah, that's right. So the, the first line of defense, so to speak, uh, is the mucin layer. So before you actually get to the epithelial cells and to the, to the receptors on the epithelial cells, you have to somehow attach and get through the mucin layer. So that's your first attachment. And, um, and then you eventually reach down to the epithelial cells. Oh, that's, that's really cool. And so we know that a lot of these human uh, adult microbes can consume the, the mucus. They can live off of it. So is, is that, are those some of the same microbes that you see can uh, interact or that can break down these HMOs that are really hard to digest? Right, so uh, that's exactly true. So microbes uh, somehow live off of your mucins, use that as energy source. Um, so you're kind of feeding your, your gut bacteria that way, not just by the food that comes from the outside, but also the mucin um, sugars that you produce on the inside. And uh, since human milk oligosaccharides are similar to mucins in structure, it's possible that you that way feed some of the bacteria that you uh, that you have in the intestine that would otherwise uh, chew on your own mucins. That that that's really awesome. So I, I wanted to jump back to the immune system real quick because I know in infants this is just such a huge area of their benefits. Um, what, what is it just GI specific immune effects or is it more whole body for the infants that uh, this immune effect happens? Yeah, it's both. It's probably uh, locally in the gut, but also on a systemic level. And, you know, keep in mind that uh, some of these oligosaccharides, just 1%, but, and that sounds very little, but 1% out of 15 gram per liter, uh, giving every two to three hours with breastfeeding, uh, 
is a very significant concentration in the in the bloodstream. So 1% is, is absorbed intact. You can actually measure that in the urine of breastfed infants. And that means that the entire system, the entire body is really exposed to hemoglobin oligosaccharides. Not, and that includes immune cells. Very possible that hemoglobin oligosaccharides after absorption have an effect on immune cells systemically, but also by having these oligosaccharides in the gut uh, and either directly having an effect on gut-associated immune system, but also then again through shaping microbial communities having indirect effects on immune system responses. Uh, there's multiple different ways really how human milk oligosaccharides can impact immune system responses. Well, that's that's really cool. And 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 so my understanding is that, that that's really unique to the infant immune uh, or to the infant GI that allows some of that absorption. Is that something that you would anticipate being in if adults were or as adults start to consume these human milk oligosaccharides? Would you expect that same one to two percent to be taken up in the bloodstream? Yeah, it's actually very similar, and we have some initial data on that. Um, we have um, done a study where we consumed oligosaccharides, uh, 2FL specifically, and we see that adults we absorb and then excrete that with the urine. Uh, so we, we anticipate that the same that we see in infants all happens in adults. Wow, okay, that that's really, really interesting to hear. Um, so I guess if we want to, uh, move to some of the adult potential for these. What's been done so far? Yeah, so uh, there is some work uh, where oligosaccharides have been um, used in adult settings, either in animal studies or in in, in humans. Uh, a lot of that, and we've alluded to that earlier, is in the in the um, space of gut health. Uh, we've done a lot of work uh, specifically on on inflammation in adults, uh, whether that's in atherosclerosis or in arthritis and, and other diseases. And we see, at least in animal models, some very remarkable uh, effects um, of some of these oligosaccharides where they suppress inflammation and uh, in animals even lead to uh, lower atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease risk. So imagine you could use a human milk oligosaccharide uh, that we know is safe because we really give it to babies every two, three hours when we breastfeed it. Uh, imagine you could use these oligosaccharides in adults and prevent people dying from stroke or heart attack uh, or, uh, you know, really lowering their pain when it comes to arthritis. That is really a, my, my dream uh, application of these oligosaccharides where you can apply it to adults that suffer from, from real killer diseases, literally, uh, and uh, lower their suffering and potentially save lives. I mean, that would be amazing, right? If we get to that next level, it's super exciting and, you know, really interesting. You know, I wanted to jump back and um, you and Weston were talking a little bit about yeast and yeast interaction. You know, a lot of both babies and adults have concerns around candida. Have you done any work specific to that or have you seen that as a whole and how candida would have an effect and how 2FL or other HMOs would have an effect on candida? Yeah, we've done some work on that. Uh, that's what I mentioned earlier, a uh, paper that we published a few years ago, where we specifically see that oligosaccharides, we don't know which ones, but that human milk oligosaccharides as a pool um, have an effect on um, on candida morphologies, morphology and it, um, attachment to epithelial cells. And oligosaccharides as a pool seem to be working very well. We just haven't identified yet which oligosaccharide is responsible for it. Uh, and again, the structure determines function, so we don't anticipate that all oligosaccharides do the same thing. But it's certainly worthwhile to look into it, um, which oligosaccharides are responsible for it. Interesting. You know, if we kind of go down that same path, we see more so in adults, you know, the, um, SIBO, so, and that concern around SIBO, and specifically this trend towards FODMAT diets. Would, if somebody, an adult or an infant, was on a FODMAT, would we consider a human milk ogular saccharide to be in that FODMAT category? Could they consume them without being of concern? Yeah, I don't see any uh, major concerns uh, about that. Like I said, human milk oligosaccharides are not directly digested uh, by the host. So it would be bacteria that digest it. Uh, we don't have to worry too much about like lactose intolerance or something like that because the lactose will not be freely available in the small intestine. Uh, it is a component of human milk oligosaccharides, but 
it's covered with other additional sugars and 2FL, for example, with fucose. So there is not that issue that we have, you know, free lactose in the small intestine. 2FL will, and other oligosaccharides will reach the large intestine, then they get degraded very quickly by bacteria. So I wouldn't have too many concerns about uh, negative uh, effects of those. Do you see any kind of motility-based effects, uh, either in infants or in adults, that these milk oligosaccharides play, just the the motility and intestinal transit effects, I guess? I know there is a few studies that currently look into motility and the use of human milk oligosaccharides. I'm not sure what those results look like, but from what I hear from people, they are fairly uh, promising, but I haven't seen those results myself. Uh, so you you were talking a little bit about potential going forwards for um, cardiovascular specific, and I imagine just general metabolic conditions. Do these have any kind of impact on something like blood sugar? Would you would you expect to see any as something that could interact with, say, somebody who has glucose? issues managing glucose because my understanding is these milk oligosaccharides are relatively sweet and they also have this prebiotic effect. Would there be any sort of glucose, blood glucose induction with it? So do we have any concerns when it comes to uh, blood glucose spikes and those kinds of things? Again, uh, I think it's important to re-emphasize that these oligosaccharides are not degraded in the small intestine, are not taken up as their monosaccharide building blocks like you would expect from lactose and from other sugars that we ingest. So the beauty of these is that they're really um, protected and make it into the, the large intestine and then have an effect on microbial communities and many other things. Yes, a certain percentage is absorbed, but again, it's absorbed as intact oligosaccharides and not as free monosaccharides like glucose and others. So we don't really anticipate, and to my knowledge, there's no data showing that there's any glucose spikes or anything when we give uh, human milk oligosaccharides. We have some initial data from animal studies that we just published in Nature Metabolism a, a couple of months ago, where you see that specific oligosaccharides, in this case it was 3 lactose, had a positive effect on glucose metabolism in the offspring. And we also see positive effects of feeding um, uh, oligosaccharides when it comes to lipid uh, levels uh, in the plasma. So I'd rather see that as a as an opportunity to get some of those metabolic factors in uh, under control. You know, Lars, when we've spoke before, we've talked also about in the infant about cognition and the role of two um, FL in cognition. Do you want to touch on that a little bit? Sure. So, so there's a few uh, studies in animals uh, that show that providing 2FL increases um, uh, learning, memory, and those kinds of um, outcomes. And, and we just published a paper together with a group in Los Angeles where we see that in a mother-infant cohort, when we analyze human milk oligosaccharide composition, 2FL concentrations at one month of age are positively associated with cognit cognitive outcome at two years of age. So not only do we have some data in animals where you can always say, well, animals, how does it translate to humans? But then we see in human cohort studies that we see very similar associations with the same oligosaccharides and cognitive outcome. Um, so that gives me greater confidence that there is something to it. And the human milk oligosaccharides in general, whether it's 2FL or, or some of the silate oligosaccharides, have been associated with cognitive development uh, for a long time, probably for the last 20, 25 years. So we're really seeing more and more data coming um, in, in that particular space. Do we see a general opportunity for an overall immune effect? Either, you know, obviously we know that immune support, breast milk supports general immune, but in a larger standpoint through synthetic forms of human milk ocular saccharides? Yeah, I think immune is a huge topic, of course, right? The immune system has so many different cells and each cell has so many different receptors and so many opportunities to engage these receptors and these immune cells with oligosaccharides or potential postbiotics that are driven by oligosaccharide metabolism. So I see that as a huge opportunity. I mentioned the work on, on cardiovascular disease and arthritis that is specifically modulating chronic macrophage inflammation. So macrophages are specific immune cells and we see that we can reduce their inflammatory state to a certain extent, which then helps us prevent diseases like cardiovascular disease or, or arthritis. And that's just one example, right? It's just one cell type, just one receptor. 
so many other opportunities when it comes to other immune cells, uh, other disease spaces. Uh, and I think this is really one of the big futures um, of the field. For these infants and kids, when they're setting their microbiome, that all happens so early. Are these going to be lifetime effects by these infants? And even you're talking about some younger children consuming these. Uh, is that going to be something that has lifelong effects? Potentially. So again, whether that's through microbes or not, I'll give you one example where we've seen how different oligosaccharides and 2FL included in that have an effect on body weight and length in infants uh, that's during the breastfeeding period. But then if you look at the same infants at five years of age, you still see this effect persisting. So there is long-term effects at least out to five years. Another example uh, recently published where we looked at specific food allergies and other allergies, and we had the great opportunity to work with a cohort where, which is still ongoing, where samples were collected back in the 80s. So these kids, these infants are now in their 30s. And uh, we've been able to look at disease outcomes, allergic diseases, when the kids are 18 years old, and we find associations between oligosaccharides that they receive during the breastfeeding period and the allergic risk and the allergic potential at 18 years. So yeah, I think there is a great potential for whatever we do in that very early period, pregnancy and lactation, that that has an immense impact on what happens throughout the rest of our lives. It's really interesting. So is there any, any thought about pregnant women or even uh, breastfeeding women consuming these type of things? Uh, you've talked about some of it can wind up in the bloodstream. Would any of that accumulate in, in breast milk? Would it support the breast milk accumulation? I know that that's variable, the amounts that show up there. Yeah, so two, two sides of that story. We don't really know what would happen if you give an oligosaccharide to mom, how that would uh, then change mom's milk composition. Uh, that's certainly an interesting question, and, and we really don't know what drives oligosaccharide composition in the milk. So what maternal factors, what can we do with mom, can we change diet, can we put her on an exercise regime, whatever it is. Um, but more interesting really is that, that these oligosaccharides are not just in the milk that's given to the infant. We find these human milk oligosaccharides in mom's circulation as early as at the end of the first trimester during pregnancy. And uh, we also have uh, found them recently in amniotic fluid. So not only is the infant exposed to the oligosaccharides during breastfeeding, but potentially also in utero, and mom is exposed to it too. And we know that breastfeeding uh, not only benefits the breastfed infant, but also the breastfeeding mom. And it could be potentially through uh, some of these oligosaccharides as well. So there is a benefit to oligosaccharides um, uh, or from these oligosaccharides to mom as well, we shouldn't underestimate that. And again, that might be uh, yet another evidence that adults are exposed to these human milk oligosaccharides. And that is when we make them ourselves during pregnancy. Well, Lars, this was so insightful. I mean, we learned a lot from what happens with 2FL and other HMOs in the mom's body potentially to, you know, potential adult applications and, of course, um, infant applications. Any last words that you'd like to leave our audience on the role of HMOs? You're so passionate about it. I'm, I'm sure you could probably talk about this all week, but we only have a short amount of time. So I want to give you that last word. Yeah, I, as you can tell, I'm super excited about it. And I mentioned that story, how we were calculating uh, what if we added this one oligosaccharide to infant formula 15 years ago? It was absolutely not possible at all. And I think that's really where I see this moving forward. Everything that we think right now, uh, I'm not sure if this is possible or not. Sky's the limit, really. Uh, there's so many advances and so many opportunities in this. Who would have thought a few years ago that we are now talking about applying these oligosaccharides to adult health? And to the exact opposite spectrum of the life course, right? We were always talking about babies. Now we're talking about the elderly that we potentially lose from cardiovascular disease. So I think the opportunities in between all that is uh, remarkable. And we probably just reached the tip of the, uh, the iceberg here. And I'm really looking forward to, to many, many more years of many, many great discoveries and, uh, and how we can really exploit the full potential of these human milk oligosaccharides. Thank you so much, Lars. This was so insightful. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much to Dr. Bode for joining us to talk about human milk oligosaccharides and 2FL. For more on this topic, go to holisticmatters.com. That's holistic with a W.